The philosopher René Descartes believed that people consisted of a body and a mind. Both were substances that could exist independently of each other. However, the properties of these substances were so different that it was incomprehensible how they could interact with each other. According to many, this interaction problem is fatal to dualism, and we therefore need a different theory to explain how mind and body relate to each other. A way to escape from the interaction problem is to claim that there are not two substances, but only one. You can then believe that this is the physical substance, which, from our modern perspective, seems to be the most plausible. The mind may exist, but it depends on the physical world for its existence. In the 18th century, however, the Irish philosopher George Berkeley opted for the mental substance. This position is called idealism and makes the material world dependent on the mental world. Berkeley's idealism can be summarized in his slogan, to be is to be perceived. Physical objects exist only because they are perceived. That sounds very strange, but Berkeley did have an argument for his position. To see why and how Berkeley defended his idealism, we must first look at another Briton, the Englishman John Locke. In his book, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, this philosopher made a difference between primary and secondary properties, or qualities, just as Galilei, Descartes and Boyle had done before him. A primary quality is a property that a thing really has, independent of any observer. For example, a bucket of water has a certain temperature, let's say 20 degrees Celsius, whether we observe that temperature or not. A secondary quality is a property that an object has because it is being perceived. If you threw snowballs with your bare hands in the middle of winter, water with a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius feels warm. But if you have been sunbathing in the summer, water with a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius feels cold. So whether the water is cold or warm is therefore not a primary property of the water, but depends on the way in which the observer perceives the temperature. Berkeley agreed with Locke that whether something is hot or cold depends on the observer. But Berkeley went one step further. According to him, the qualities that Locke considered primary qualities, such as size, were secondary qualities as well. If you are an insect, then a dice may seem very large. For us humans, a dice seems very small. Whether an object is large or small is therefore dependent on the observer, and according to Berkeley, we must include that size is also a secondary quality. This applies to all properties that Locke believed to be primary. Thus, all properties of objects depend on an observer. Without an observer, the water is not hot or cold, and a dice is not large or small. Berkeley's idealism, however, is untenable. Two important points of criticism demonstrate this. The most important point of criticism is that he does not reason properly. The fact that a pebble is large for an insect and small for a human does not make the dimensions dependent on observer. A dice that has a height, length and width of one centimeter is large for an insect and small for a human, but that this dice is one cubic centimeter is independent of any observer. A second point of criticism is that Berkeley's vision of the relationship between the mental and physical world leads to an absurd conclusion. If to be is to be perceived, then there is a cake if it is perceived by someone. But what happens to the cake when nobody's looking at it? Does the cake then cease to exist? No. Practice shows that if you do not look at an object for a moment, it will not disappear. If Berkeley is right, it means that there must be a mental entity that perceived the cake while no one else was looking. This applies to all objects in the world that are temporarily not observed by people. That mental entity is God, according to Bishop Berkeley. God sees everything. Berkeley, therefore, believes that this proves that God must exist. For many philosophers, this conclusion is so absurd that the starting point, Berkeley's idealism, must be incorrect. Due to these two issues, Berkeley's position in the mind-body debate is untenable. After substance dualism, idealism now fails to provide a serious view on the relationship between the mind and the body we must look for a different theory that does provide insight into the mind-body relationship.